TV legend Keith Floyd was a charismatic bon viveur with an irreverent twinkle in his eye. Over the years, he's taken us on a groundbreaking tour of the world's cuisine, stopping regularly en route for the obligatory slurp of fine wine. An original, he's been much imitated, but never really bettered. Hello, dear gastronauts. Do you realise that for the price of, what, half a bitter, you can have a fishy treat with a bunch of prats? I'm sorry, it's prats. He's been a part of the TV landscape for so long, it's easy to forget what a revolutionary Keith Floyd was. Truly pioneering, he was the original rock and roll TV super chef. Basically, I think Keith was a rock and roll star. He was flamboyant, he was energetic, he was kind of literally... You, you got this idea that you never quite knew what was going to happen next. I, I wish I could have been as spontaneous as Keith. He was mercurial. He just went up and then burst, really. To make the perfect shellfish gumbo, you know, a fistful of dollars. Thank you. He brought panache and energy and style and, and fun. Floyd was really the first TV chef to, to drag cooking, kicking and screaming out of the studio. Ginger! Red peppers, garlic, chilies. You know, he was a great British eccentric, but he was also very modern at the same time. What an achievement. Well, I think Keith was actually one of the first bad boy TV chefs, really, because he was irreverent. It seems to be a terrible thing to do to your family, but I always wanted my mother-in-law on one of my programmes, and it's taken me 25 years to catch her, actually. He drank on screen. Please excuse me. And this whole show was punctuated by... The Strangler's Peaches. Walking on the beaches, looking at the beaches. All you had to do was put a camera on him and allow him to be himself. So if this takes a little time to cook, bear with me, because we don't pull things out of the oven that we've, you know, just happened to have ready, like all those other TV programmes. Before Keith Floyd bounded onto our screens in 1984, cooking on TV was very different. It had become a very, very staid, a very studio-based format, I think, the cookery programme. <laughs> And I always put a penny on when I'm cooking, you know, because I'm inclined to drop things down the front of my dress. <laughs> yes. They were all very staid. The proof will come when we take the top off, won't it, Mr Barrett, eh? Yes. They were all very, uh, like, school teachers. Well, hello again, and welcome to the cookery course. They were all very pompous. I'm very unsure in my own mind that there's anything which has contributed more to modern cookery than kitchen form. I can't remember when, um, y you know, that... Fearsome woman, <laughs> Fanny Craddock was on. I mean, I, I never enjoyed that. I mean, I, I just didn't see the point of it. All that sort of bossiness and that poor, henpecked um, husband of hers. There was Delia, of course, and I did have a lot of time for Delia because she did it very well. If you want to make an omelette for one person, you need two eggs. If it's a very hungry person, you could use three. But, bless her, it was more of a sort of course than, than actually getting stuck into the wine. So much of, of cookery programmes is, is prepared in advance, it's all worked out very carefully in the camera angles and the camera shots and bits that are prepared earlier. For this, I need to begin with bean sprouts. And I think by taking that convention head on us and saying, no, we're going to do it in real time, we're going to stick a camera on it and see if it works, he just reinvented it completely. Oh, oh. Oh, up. Born in Southampton in the early 40s, his family wasn't posh. In fact, his dad worked for the electricity board. But Floyd did go to a posh school, and then after a brief spell as a local newspaper reporter in Bristol, he joined the Royal Tank Regiment as a second lieutenant. Army life wasn't a natural fit for Floyd, but it did give him a taste of what he really wanted to do, be a chef. After odd-jobbing his way around France, Floyd went on to open his own restaurant in 1966, by which time he was married and a dad. He worked morning, noon and night. I don't think he, he slept, and the, the pressures must have been enormous, because they started with virtually no money. And then everything started to grow quite rapidly, and at the end, he had three restaurants, within a very short period of time, in his 20s. Absolutely extraordinary. By the end of the decade, things were going wrong. He sold up and spent a year sailing around the Med, dabbling in antiques and fine wines, of course. Eventually, mooring up in the south of France, opening a restaurant in lille sur la sourgue Floyd returned to Blighty in the 80s, opening a restaurant in Bristol with wife number two in tow. 
It was here that TV producer David Pritchard walked into his life. His bistro in Bristol was lovely. I, I mean, it had a distinctive smell. It was a sort of mixture of, uh, of butter and garlic and coffee and a little hint of gulas. I remember going there for the very first time and he, he just said, so, uh, what do you do then? What do you, what do you do for a living and everything? And I said, well, I'm a, I'm a TV producer. He said, they come in my restaurant, they say I'd be fabulous on television, um, they drink my best brandy and I never see them again. But Pritchard came back and found him a slot on a local youth show. Before that, there's something we've never done before on RPM, that's a cookery lesson. Not just any old cookery lesson, mind you, because we asked Keith Floyd to make a meal for six. And so the next day, I, I drove round to the restaurant with a little contract, and I said, look, cook a meal for six people for less than a pound a head. Hello, gastronauts. I didn't suppose you expected to see me on a rock and roll programme. And there were, I mean, three huge rabbits the size of whippets. There were there was bottles of brandy, bottles of chanterelle mushrooms, there was all sorts of things going there. And he completely disregarded my instructions. This food has got to taste like sunshine at the end of the day. It hasn't got to taste bland, it's got to have punch and love and happiness in it. And you won't get that by, for instance, picking up nine grains of salt and gently putting them in. You've got to throw things into the pan. You've got to put your heart, your guts, everything into it. He was OK, the, the sequence. But afterwards, he said, I remember I was standing outside of, of, of his restaurant with him after the filming, and he said, do you know, he said, he said one day cooks are going to be as famous as racing car drivers and rock guitarists. And he was right. I didn't think so at the time, but he was right. <laughs> Rock and roll was in Floyd's DNA. He knew the Stranglers from his Bristol restaurant. He was a genuine fan, and they provided the distinctive soundtracks to his early shows. Floyd and Pritchard's hit series, Floyd on Fish, has become a blueprint for today's campaigning super chefs, Jamie, Gordon and Hugh. Floyd on Fish was really something of a manifesto for, for Floyd because it, he was so passionate about the kind of fish that we have in Britain, in our waters around Britain, and very frustrated, I think, by this British uh, sort of anxiety about fish. Do you know, none of you lot will eat these. All of these are going to Spain, to France, to Italy, and they'll be the centrepiece of a most fabulous assiette of freedom air. And you'll crack open the claws, dip it into unctuous yellow mayonnaise, and think, as they must think, what fools the Brits are for not taking advantage of the wonderful things we've got around our shores. Actually, although it was fantastically entertaining, at, at one level this was a campaigning series because this was Floyd saying, look, haddock and chips, cotton chips, fish fingers, is that all we're good for? I remember he was at a French seaside port and there was a lot of school kids being taught by their teacher. And he asked these kids a question. Mes enfants, aimez-vous les huîtres? Oui! Voilà. That's it, isn't it? I mean, what more can you want? He's so thrilled, but also he's a little bit broken-hearted because you can see that he thinks this is how food culture should be, where your children are shown everything and where it's quite normal for school kids to be eating oysters. Always happy to share the screen with talent, Floyd featured a young restaurateur unwittingly setting him on the path to become a household name himself. Feast your eyes on a young Rick Stein. This was the first piece I did with Keith. I remember it was a, a roasted sea bass stuffed with some vegetables with a sorrel sauce and a bottle of Riesling. I can remember it to this day. It's so important to me. Yeah. One of the most important things about Floyd on Fish is the, uh, the drinking that goes with it because no good cooking comes without good drinking. It was just... You know, mischievous, there was lots of boozing. Hey, welcome to your kitchen. Well, cheers, cheers. The wine's very nice. Well, it is, isn't it? In those days, one did film and, um, and drink. These days, sadly, film only. We drink later, which is... Slip-ups and mistakes were an intrinsic part of the show and celebrated. You can roast it, Nick tells me, too. So that's what we're going to do with this one. He's going to show us how to do it. It was the first time I'd ever been on screen with Keith. Um, I'd met him quite a few times before, which, looking at it again, 
the fact you call me Nick. I, I wonder why. This is Nick's own very special recipe. Rick, dear boy. Rick. Rick! Oh, I'm terribly sorry. <laughs> well, once you've seen one cook, you've seen them all. <laughs> you know, that little, that little dig at me is part of what he was all about, really. He was um, mischievous. He could be a bit difficult. Put it mildly. Let me call you Charles for the rest of the programme. Why not? Why Fine, not? great. Now look, this is a television programme. Film's very expensive. Get on with the cooking. Okay. First of all, we were going to eat on the quayside, and then David said, "No, I, we won't do it on the quayside. We'll, we'll put it on that trawler." And then he got the, the trawler owner to fire the old trawler up, and we went out to sea on it. And I always remember thinking. We're off to a better life. This is such fun. Thank you very much for joining us for our lunch. I hope you'll join us on the next Floyd on Fish programme. Because believe me, my gastronauts, this is the way to eat fish. <laughs> wow. Floyd's legacy extends beyond food. He was also a broadcasting pioneer. Whilst filming this series, Floyd stumbled across the presenting style that would not only define him, but change the face of TV. Fresh, fresh, fresh from the Dorset seaside, cleaned, presented in their shells. Don't look at me, I'm trying to explain the food. This is a food programme, you half-wit, come back. I think when the cam he made the camera go back down on the scallops, um, I just think it changed everything because, um, as he quite rightly said, and I mean, th this is the point, he knew what he was saying, but, you know, it, the food is the star. You don't have to move the camera to look for me. They know I've got to move to get the food in. Don't be so wet. You know, it's the pot that counts. For heaven's sake. Everybody in sort of TV is so concerned about doing their job properly, they miss the damn point of the whole thing, which is food! I know all of those of you who like me so much will be very disappointed right now that you can't see me. I said stay with the pot! Ah, oh, that is a joy to watch, you know, a real joy to watch, because still today, you know, you often get that situation where it's all on the presenter, but it's about the food in the pan. Now, come to me. Hold on a minute. Come back, come back. Look. This is very difficult for me. I am a cook. I present television cookery programmes, but I'm not a director. I do rely on competent staff. Would you get it right in future, please? Thank you. What it did was, I think, it involved the viewer more. Julie, his, his second or, or, or possibly third wife, was there when we were filming this scallop sequence. And she said afterwards, she said, oh, David, please, please don't put that in. She said it would be... You know, he looks so arrogant and he, he looks a bit drunk and he's a bit bossy. And I said, well, you know, isn't that the essence of the man? The show was a hit. Floyd became a star. And for the first time, it was cool for men not only to watch cooking shows on TV, but to cook themselves. Ow! This is Britain's first and most popular. <laughs> first, that's all right, doesn't matter. He made the bloke at home want to cook. Suddenly they had a confidence because they could see this chap, you know, cooking away. And oh, by the way, you are allowed a glass to go with it, so that always helped. Yeah, it was just blokish. It was proper blokish stuff. He'd get his hands dirty, he'd get him stuck in, he'd have a big glug of wine. I'm going to go some cooking, I'm going to have a slurp. If you're a boy and you like sort of, you know, being flamboyant and you like drinking a bit and you like messing around the kitchen, you like the what going up like that, it's part of your life. I pulled the most beautiful bird on the whole island. <laughs> I think Keith Floyd appealed to men because he was not at all fussy in the kitchen. It wasn't about recipes and chopping stuff out and being precise and, and the kind of stuff that men initially thought was, you know, a little bit restrictive. It was about having fun and being a bit kind of macho about it as well. I mean, there's a bunch of generals. No, they're not. What are they called? Admirals. Standing over there and they're going to get to eat all of this shortly. <laughs> it, it never seemed fiddly or silly or twee. It was, you know, it was his personality and he was very much a man's man and I think that's what came through. We passed that. The director. Who would not get in the World Cup this year? I wish this man had been on TV when I was at school because I was a fanatical cook, but I daren't tell any of my friends. I had to tell them that I'd scored a hat trick instead and playing a game of football when in fact I made a you know a little lamentato or something. And all I've got to offer you is either, and the choice is yours, one of my muscles or a big kiss. Oh. Which will you have? A big kiss. Mm. Thanks ever so much. <laughs> All 
was attempting to cook in real time, Floyd tested the team's creativity to the limit, having a poke at TV traditions. That is a frying pan. Stay with that, Clive, while I get my act together. We do try to do things in real time and live, so let's hope I've got the butter melting away there properly. Of course, the trouble is, if you say that you're going to cook in real time, uh, you know, cooking does take time, so what are you going to do in the bits in between? Uh, right, that's nearly ready now. Yeah. Bon? No, 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 no. Bon. 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 So let's, I've still got to leave a little bit longer. What do we do? Oh, I'll ask the director, what, what should we do now while well, I'm just waiting for that to, to evaporate a bit? Walk out of shot would be a good idea. I'm going to walk out of shot. I remember one he did in Jersey where he was cooking, of all things, a conger eel. Uh, and, uh, and he said, this is going to take an hour to simmer. Well, now, the audience think, my goodness, we don't have to sit here for an hour watching this thing simmer, are we? A bit tedious, all of this, isn't it? Here I am stirring away. Only two more things to go. That's where they started to scratch their heads and say, well, you know, um, right, OK, let's, uh, let's play a piece of music or let's show you, I don't know, Potter's Wheel or the test card or something like that. But I'll have to leave the director to get me out of this tricky sequence while this simmers away for an hour or so. I'm going to have another glass of milk. That was really interesting, wasn't it? You know, how he dreams up these brilliant little interludes, I shall never know. Not sure that I really care. Anyway... So he was telling you that there was a little cheating going on there, whereas the other people just cheat. Now, now, this is something where typical Floyd, you know, the cameraman had gone around taking pretty shots of the area and thinking he was doing a wonderful job. And Keith said, well, this is all very boring or something. I can't remember the exact words. But he said, you know, that's absolutely ridiculous. We're here for the food. Sorry about this, but this is a bit where Clive tries to win a few prizes for really evocative photography and the director likes to do the travelogue bit. They're very keen on all of this round in the Dordogne because they reckon it was the birthplace of man. In fact, just a few kilometres down the road, there are some caves with prehistoric drawings. Happily, they were shut while we were there filming, otherwise we'd be down scrabbling about in the dark looking at little oxes and wood fires and things. What was attractive about Keith was that he, he, he couldn't stand convention and he would just undermine things all the time. He, just, he had no truck with it at all. So all the things that you know, because people like to make television look look pretty or you know really nice shots and really beautifully done. He didn't have any time for that. He just thought, let's just get on and do it. Their irreverent comedy had no boundaries. In one scene, they got their own back on a grumpy chef by broadcasting a scathing commentary of his behaviour. And I'm going to write a little commentary now. But David, you're the blinking director. What shall I? I mean, how do I deal with this? Well, I think bit? you should say what he's what he's actually cutting up at the moment. Right. Well, you see. He's got to start by chopping the onions, and by the way, this was a very, very difficult bit because uh, the atmosphere was so tense, you could cut the whole thing with a blinking knife, actually. The director didn't like the cook very much. The cook resented the film crew being in there. He was very miserable, wasn't he? He was very unhappy. He was very, very miserable. Yeah. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. If I did rude things about everyone I didn't like, I'd never stop talking. We should hurry up a bit. I'm sure he was deliberately going slow that day, you know? The lighting man nearly bopped him, you know. I know. <laughs> the whole thing about Keith was that it was unusual. It wasn't what you'd seen before, and I don't think it's what I've seen since, and probably no one will ever do it again, because he was unique. Explain what's in the soup, yeah? what? Explain what's in the soup. Ah, oh, this viewers. is... Right, viewers, this is one... Here's one of us. This is what we do when we're not making movies, OK? It's really good, isn't it? Improvant, sunshine and soup. Now, this soup is a remarkable soup. OK, it's called Soup au Pesco. Stop <laughs> coughing when I'm speaking, would you? He's the lighting man, and he hasn't been responsible for the sun. I don't know what we've got him here for. Anyway, forget all that. This is called Soup au Pesco. <laughs> and the essential thing is, is lots of fresh vegetables, like carrots and beans and haricot beans, these little white ones with a slightly pink one. I don't know where that came from. Is that all right for you? Yeah, it's quite good. OK, and board. For the very first time in TV history, Floyd took cooking outside into the real world. That meant he was at the mercy of the elements and the locals. Even in paradise it rains, and it doesn't matter on a Floyd cooking programme. When he hit the road, 
it was just great because he was very inclusive. And I mean, he did some mad stuff. Yeah. I mean, he did some mad he stuff. He did stuff. I wish you could smell this. It is unctuous and delicious. The sugar has caramelized around the pieces of meat. The coconut milk is reduced and it's ready for the next phase. Have a quick look at that before I get on with it, please, Paul. There's a great scene where he's, uh, where he's cooking. <laughs> He's cooking with a volleyball match going on. As they're obviously clearly really bad at volleyball. That's fine. Is any ball hitting me? That was. I think he said. Well, that's the whiskey gone. And then, oh, that's the whiskey gone. And, yes. and it's all like kind of. And it's all like kind of off the wall and mad. <laughs> there was no polish to it. It was simply. This is how it works. This is yeah. how we do it. And I just loved that because it was television that you could absolutely 100% relate to. Never, ever, ever, they said, work with animals and children. This director, this ex-director we just fired this morning, Mike Connors, has got this brilliant idea of surrounding me with ostriches. In a field, on an ostrich farm, with a load of ostriches. And what was he cooking? Ostrich stew. It's always a first time for everything. One thing that made Floyd on telly always a thrill was that, that sense of anything could happen. It was unplanned, it was spontaneous, and that, of course, is, is the holy grail of, of television. And those of us who make cooking programmes now, I mean, you know, we put, it, put in an awful lot of time trying to plan these fantastic, spontaneous moments. And so another cooking sketch ends in total chaos as the birds fight back. You got the truth. You know, what you saw is what really happened. I want half an hour, a half an hour of their, of their generosity, of, 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 of their spirit, <laughs> to allow us to get on with what we've come here to do. That's all. Beside me and around me is one hell of a row going on because some mealy mouthed water taxi boatmen do not want us to film on this quay. They want $100 each for us to walk where any member of the public can walk, which is absolutely scandalous. And we're here with goodwill, with happiness in our hearts, to make a programme to glorify the food and the attitude of Hong Kong. Sadly, this morning we haven't found it. I might have to shout a bit because they're determined to ruin our sequence, but we're going ahead anyway. One of the things that TV people go on and on about now is, is this whole idea of jeopardy, the, the, the idea of that things that are edgy and, and, and things that, oh, the possibility of things going wrong. Keith was doing that 20 years ago. Today, I mean, I've been several weeks around this place, and honestly, I haven't been drinking, but I feel a bit stressed this morning. I don't really feel stressed. I like a battle, I like a challenge, but I think I'll drink to our success with their wine. <laughs> Cheers to us. A quick swig of what, you know, made uh, the Navy famous. Always self-knowing, Floyd's on-screen style became synonymous with his regular and healthy-sized slurps of wine, which lubricated his performance. You might be looking at my eyes and saying, my God, he looks in a terrible mess. Well, the truth is, I am in a terrible mess. Um, you know, you can't help it. France, wine, really good time here in San Malo, and I'm afraid we overdid it a bit last night. Do you not have any? No, not now. I just had my tea. Everybody knows he liked the tipple. And, and you know, can it, can it knock that man? You no, can it. No. It would be just wrong. Excuse me, sorry about that. If I have a little. He would drink good wine, you know. He'd have a good very shambata. He, he would appreciate it. Or a great Montrachet. He'd tell you about it, yeah. though. And he'd go, This is what I was this is what I'm drinking. And you know what was great? There was an honesty about him. Never cook with wine that you can't drink. I mean, if the wine is not good enough to drink, which this most certainly is. You mustn't cook with it. He did that naturally. It wasn't, it wasn't a question. I mean, I've seen him cook in his kitchen anyway, and he had a glass of wine there. One of the most essential things is going to be a bottle of good, strong red wine, because you'll probably need half a bottle to go into the, uh, into the dish itself, and you're going to need half a bottle to go into yourself to make things really cheerful. People made a lot of fun about the sort of, sort of size of the, of the wine glasses <laughs> he would be getting through when he, when he was cooking, but it was a sheer love for food and wine. When you look at it, you must like it. If you don't like it, when you see it, you will never enjoy it. So it's like a woman? Exactly. Exactly. <coughs> his next series would perhaps be his greatest. The enduring all-time classic, Floyd on France. There's no question for me Floyd on France was the greatest culinary TV show of all time. There's no two ways about it. I really do stand and I believe that. It actually opened up the eyes to the whole of the UK that what simple food can really be all about. This is what it's all about down here, garlic. 
not those miserable little ungenerous ones you buy in boxes in supermarkets back home, but fat, violet clothes. It was about quality ingredients, so that was a brilliant education for us all. And it was then how to actually put life into it, into the pan. Seeing the succulence and the joy on his face as he started to relish in all of those flavours, I thought, oh, this is cooking, I want to go and eat out again. <laughs> Yes, I know, I'm posing, but it's my show, and anyway, it's only rock and roll. And if you don't get a buzz out of being in this dramatic land, then, my dear faded gastronaut, you must be on the way out. You can't help being carried away by the scents and the colours. The atmosphere is heady. And now we're going to see what kind of a fool I can possibly make of myself by putting this liquid mixture into here. And it's bound just to separate into a whole... Oh, no, it's not. Look. It is... Hey, it's working. This is incredible. Now, how do I get the damn thing off the spoon? That's what I'm not so sure about. Mark? Où est le chef? Chef! Oh, chef! Chef! This was Warts and All Broadcasting, where culinary cock-ups provided the comedy including them endeared Floyd to the public even more. She's one of those ladies who's a bit of a tart, a bit precise, doesn't like film crews interrupting her work, which she takes very seriously. So I'm letting them get on with it while I'm just sitting here having a slight glass of wine, and later on, when she's ready, and if she's in a bit of a better mood, we'll try and get in and see exactly what she's doing. What we're doing here is making what we call a very simple Perigord omelette of uh, seps, you see, wild mushrooms. I remember there's one fantastic clip where he was making it was a sep omelette, using the typical fat of the region with the old dragon peering over my shoulder, which is goose fat, by the way. We put it onto the stove like that. And uh, he made the omelette. Uh, just when it was just about to be ready, he put the seps in, folded it over, put it on the plate. That was it. The woman told him it was all wrong. Uh, oh, but ça va, ça va, oui. C'est pas mal. <laughs> For anybody that cooks on telly, there's always that moment what do you think? I'd like her to come to England and cook a, cook a roast beef and Yorkshire pudding with my mother standing over her shoulder like that. I hated cooking somebody's dish with them watching me do it. It is so embarrassing. Ladies and gentlemen, I present Omnitus Set, cooked by Madame Moulin. Well, the essential difference there is that she cooked hers on wow. both sides. But that is a sort of, actually, if I may say so, a peasant way of cooking an omelette, because that omelette will be, can be served cold and it's tougher and stronger, could be carried into the fields. He was right. He, what he said about that peasant way of cooking the dish was absolutely right. I won't dispute with her whose was the best. It both had the same good ingredients, two different ways, OK? But that's nothing compared to the, the, the classic scene when he's at that woman's house making pipa hard. Un peu de plus plus de plus. OK, OK, voilà, voilà, voilà. voilà. C'est comme ça, parce que sinon, les œufs, s'ils sont pas battus, ils sont pas battus, ça sert à rien. Que de dire, tcha, 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 tcha. Nous avons des rêves douaniers, as we say. Pas comme ça qu'on fait une pipa hard, hein. Ma petite pipa hard, silence pour l'instant, s'il te plaît. Écoute, et qui devait au début préparer toutes les petites assiettes comme ça pour faire la pipa hard, eh bien, je t'assure que... Real Basque people would not go to this ridiculous detail to prepare what is a perfectly ordinary, simple scrambled eggs and tomato dish, Les she balls. says. Now, you let that simmer away for five or ten minutes or so. No, it's not bien tout ça. She says it's no good. But she didn't even want to taste it. She said, I know, I, having seen the way you've made it, I know I don't want to taste that. Vu la façon so she has no real interest in eating it because the way I cooked it was so off-putting that she knows already it's going to taste absolutely awful. Les piments sont crus. The peppers are raw. And she said, not enough salt. He translated it. She said, not enough pepper. He translated it. Absolument pas les herbes, ni le thym, ni le laurier, ni rien de tout ça. In brief, it's absolute rubbish. And he yeah, took it right on the chin and he just said, well, you know, the best I can do, you do it. And so, and, and, and she did. Look at that rubbish there. Heavy, lumpy, nasty, British Rail-style scrambled eggs with a tin of old ratatouille stuffed into it. Where is this? With these lovely, crunchy slices of jambon de bayon. Magic flavours. We should go off somewhere together, shouldn't we? Bye-bye. Genius. He turned it all round. Most people now would say, absolutely not. Don't put that on the air. I'm a serious chef. I want to be taken very seriously. Would people do that on TV now? Probably not quite as openly and easily as, uh, as, uh, as Keith did. 
I did meet this chap who said, you know, he had a balloon, and he said, you'll get some fabulous film of Keith Floyd in my balloon. And um, I thought, ooh, that sounds lovely, because, you know, the autumnal colours. I mean, Keith wasn't very impressed with this plan of mine. He said it was simply a question of mind over matter. He didn't mind, and I didn't matter. But things went wrong, we ran out of gas, and, you've got it, we crash-landed in the road. Ha, ha, ha. It was a very good crash landing, I was told, but of course he didn't speak to me for weeks after that. André Graff, my mad pilot, managed to save a little gas, of course, for what he called essential requirements. This is the other service. <laughs> <laughs> By the end of the 80s, Floyd was a major star. The first time I met Keith was when he walked into my restaurant, Harvey's on Wandsworth Common. I was a very young man and in walked Keith Floyd. The man I'd always wanted to meet. The man who made great TV shows. The man who had a wealth of knowledge when it came to food and gastronomy. He walked in. Just his presence was extraordinary. His engaging honesty and skill as a raconteur meant he was much in demand for chat shows. One man who came to my restaurant regularly and always found fault in some way. The vinaigrette was a little too oily. Um, the lettuce hadn't been dried and wasn't sticking up the right way. I mean, but this guy can wit it off, but he kept coming. And one night I couldn't stand it any longer. It was a few years ago, and they used to have these big sort of paper mache cork beer mats around. I got one. And I soaked this beer mat in brandy. I dipped it in flour, dredged it in beaten milk and egg covered it in golden, freshly baked, not Mr. Paxo's stuff, breadcrumbs, <laughs> soaked it in butter with a, a mirepoix of little mushrooms and shallots and things like that, <laughs> flamed it in cognac, put a cream sauce over it, and he ate it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, do you know, the potatoes were a little hard tonight. <laughs> he even suffered the ultimate celebrity accolade of being impersonated by Rory Bremner. Quick last minute recipe for Christmas. Very simple. And Delia Smith, if you're watching, cheers. Mm. Right, all you need for this one is ten parts of whiskey. There we go. Five parts of gin. Slosh of vodka. Dash of rum, just to taste. And then our old friend here. Look out. Watch this very, very carefully, Dennis. Rather delicate. There we go. Let's get the right amount. Right, that goes down. Mm. Sorry. Oh, and of course this chum here. Aviation fuel. There we go. Don't forget that. Don't be home, by the way. Right. There we go. Uh. Once again, Floyd came up with a brand new pioneering concept for his next series. He went to visit Britain's best food producers. It's the first time for several hundred years that a soft cream cheese has been made in the British Isles, or more precisely, here in Ireland. My unceasing search for regional culinary excellence has become almost like the search of the Holy Grail, or as we say in the trade, the Holy Quail. He changed the way that we made food programmes, and he changed the way that the general public thought about food on television. He was so popular, so successful, because he was so brilliant at what he did and so enthusiastic that I do believe that he made the British public more interested in where their food came from, more concerned about the quality of their ingredients and actually more prepared to accept other food cultures. In this series, Floyd on Britain and Ireland, he discovered another gifted young chef, Gary Rhodes. I remember hanging around the, sort of the staff entrance thinking, He's not here yet, he's not here. Hanging around and then we were sort of poking our heads around the corner to see him arrive to all of a sudden see a Volvo estate turn up. And I thought, that's not Keith Floyd, surely. Anyway, Richard, watch the man. He's the business. Right, what I'm actually going to do is just uh, quickly prep this up. Well, I've got this long-standing reputation of talking too much. He's going like a train. Particularly when we're talking about food. Uh, it has to be tender but not falling off the bone and stringy and you can't allow to undercook it where it's tough and you can't even get it off the bone. And all so of that takes about perfect. three hours. And this one point he just said, shut up Rhodes, this is my show, shut up. Shut up. It takes about three hours, you've been bossy enough. And he turns to camera and just carries on and puts me in my place and I'm standing there, oh goodness me, what do I do next? Does he mean it or not? But it wasn't all star-studded. He loved to find and celebrate real characters and eccentrics. 
Uh, is that all right? Yes, it's lovely and fluffy. That's super. That's lovely and fluffy. So next it's phase... It's just about four out of ten, but anyway, there we are. Right, into there. In we go. It seems to me that Keith plonked himself down in places and, and not only dealt with the food, but he met local people and he talked to them. Uh, either he liked them or he didn't like them. It didn't really matter, but they came part of the show and I think that's wonderful because the local people in the area where you're cooking speak volumes about the culture and ethos of the place. I've been bossed around, pilloried to post by this dreadful old dragon, and last we're back on the Floyd programme, so we'll have a little glass of this. Uh, there was some strange Welsh or Irish woman he met, and he called her a dragon, I think. Well, she didn't mind, you know, because it's all good fun. You've made pizzas, haven't you? I've made pizzas, well, yes, but not with an expert baker <laughs> overseeing what I'm doing, so I'm bound to roll it out the wrong I never way. feel very expert when I have all the food. I'm an amateur. Um, well, I am really. Doesn't it feel lovely? It's beautiful. I wish we could make sexy, love to it. Yes. <laughs> Very sensitive. Later, dear, later. Uh, well, is we'll... that a problem? Oh, no jokes about buns in the oven, OK? From anybody. <laughs> One of the amazing, uh, almost contradictions of, of Keith is that he knew so much and he taught so much. Uh, but he never lost that, that boyish enthusiasm for discovering more. You got the feeling that even when the cameras went home, he might well go on somewhere else to find something else exciting to eat and uh, eventually it took him around the world. Floyd's TV journey continued over the following years with gastronomic tours of Thailand, Vietnam, Australia and India. Ying is all very well. On the boat, don't worry. Ying is all very well but you need some yang in it and the yang is this down here. The ginger, the garlic, and the chilies. Okay, that's the yang. That puts the spice into the whole thing. Later on in his television career, he started going further afield and cooking things that were actually way out of people's comfort zones. Yes, you're absolutely right. Up to me, please, Vlad. They are, I'm afraid, puffins. Well, it seemed to me the further Keith went around the world, the further extreme islands and little places he found, the more outrageous he'd become. I mean, for goodness' sake. There was one point where he even cooked puffin. I mean, we all know puffin is a seriously protected species, but there he was on there on a boat with three dead puffins, and he was going to cook them. Where are you going, Vlad? Back here, please. I'm talking to you. Um, rather than go back home and cook these, we thought we'd do them here, because get the whole day's work over with. He got in such trouble with that. I mean, the Norwegian government were up in arms, I think. Everyone was up in arms. But he said, listen, I may not agree with it, but I've got to show you, haven't I? Yeah, right. And actually, I have to tell you, it's damn nice. <laughs> his TV success was sadly not reflected in his businesses. When he was running very successful restaurants, he couldn't deal with the finances. But let's be honest, I mean, Keith Floyd was not a great restaurateur. Funny enough, he, he filled his restaurants, but he didn't know how to make money. He, he probably drank a lot of the profits, you know, if we're being honest. He, would sit, he was a very, very generous man, so he'd give away a lot to his customers. He was so generous that he never made any money at all. <laughs> I think that the only thing that really makes me sad about Keith and, um, is that uh, uh, he brought so much joy to everyone, but the poor man has such a, I don't know, a difficult personal life, and that is a tinge of sadness for me, and um, uh, he was so happy uh, on television, and I wish that he had more of a smile for himself. I don't think that the restaurants had a physically bad effect on him. I think in the end uh, it must have been fame that had a physically bad effect on him. He was a cad, you know, but he did it all with a smile and, you know, we need people like that. We need people that are a bit naughty, a bit dangerous, a bit arrogant, a bit nasty at times, but just full of life. In his later years, he lived in, uh, in Oxfordshire, in, in a, a town where I live, and um, we were asked to do a local um, festival. And uh, they said, we'll get Keith, he'll, he'll, he'll introduce you, he'll be, a, be your warm-up man. Um, I think it's sort of more of a flambe, really, because uh, I arrived and Keith had, he'd had a few. <laughs> the, the bow tie was sort of swinging around his knee, oh, hello, dear boy, right, let's work out what we're going to do. And I don't think I've ever been introduced quite like, like he did it. He, he, he started, he said, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Keith Floyd, as you know, and, and I'm a chef, um, and, and I'm a um, <laughs> So where do you go from there? 
So uh, I think the audience will, will remember that for a very long time, but I, I, I kind of doubt that Keith remembered it the next morning. But what will Keith Floyd be remembered for? Hail, little instrument of vast salvation. Pilchard, I ween a most soul-saving fish on which the Catholics in Lent are crammed, who, had they not poor souls, this lively fish would eat flesh and consequently be damned. This is crazy, isn't it? Absolutely stupid. Most chefs agree that today's cooking shows owe it all to him. Floyd's legacy was really is you know, modern food on television. I think he made things possible for all of us. Um, there would be no Gordon Ramsay, no Jamie Oliver, none of the, that freshness, none of that energy, none of that, um, none of that pizzazz, none of that showmanship without Floyd. He was the great original. He was the one who broke down the barriers and opened up the doors and made cooking fun. Floyd came along and he really bashed down the rest of the walls and threw them aside and said, hey, it's okay to love food, to have fun with it, to laugh about it, to take pleasure in it. Then along came the rest of the, the chefs. He had the Jamie, whether it's Nigella, Rick, all of these people, and they really have a lot to thank Floyd for because they couldn't do what they do so well if he hadn't done it first. Well, if all us modern-day TV chefs are honest, I think we owe our living to Floyd in many ways. He was the man, I think, that introduced personality you know, into cooking on TV. Just watching those clips, I was just just taken with the fact that, that they haven't dated at all. I mean, some of them were made over 20 years ago, and they're still as fresh as the day they were made. And I think that's really because he was speaking from the heart, and he was original. And I think what he's, what he's done for food, his lasting legacy, is that he's made food, like, real. You know, it's not something that you retire in the kitchen to do. It's part of everyday life. For me, Keith's left a legacy of that enjoyment of being able to create something out of nothing, um, but above all else, to give enjoyment for food. Um, and Keith was, had that unique ability to create happiness wherever he went. If Keith cared about how he was remembered, and I'm not sure from his attitude he, he did much, he'd want to be remembered as someone who, who changed things, who presented food to the British public in a manner no one else had ever done, and presented it very successfully, and that perhaps the sheer joy of his spirit would be remembered and perhaps help people after his death. That would be the best thing he could do, to have spread some joy, and he did spread joy. Keith, wherever you are, down there, up there, cheers. And it still tastes pucker. I mean, it's, it's quite fattening, but, you know, who cares? Cookery shows are now more popular than ever. But had it not been for Keith Floyd's groundbreaking approach, maybe we wouldn't be having so much fun in the kitchen. Duck! <laughs> he was the first rock-and-roll TV chef and revolutionise the way we think about food in Britain today. Just watching Keith's programmes made me want to be bold and want to try new things, and, and uh, there's absolutely no way that I would have uh, ended up doing what I'm doing, and, and certainly in the way that I'm doing it, if it wasn't for him. Keith, his life, without question, was one of the most beautiful jigsaws I've ever seen. It had a bit of everything. And I'm sure if Keith was sitting where I'm sitting today, and he was asked if he had any regrets. I'm sure he would say no. He lived his life beautifully. Do you know, I think I must be one of the luckiest chaps in the whole world. I travel it, I eat it, I drink it, I smell it, and I touch it.